Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really happy to address the web seminar that has kept the number theory community together during the dark times of the pandemic. My subject today is going to be counting and equidistribution uh, in hyperbolic spaces, whatever this means. And I'm going to describe a number of results, some of them going back to older times in the 50s, all to very recent results of me and my collaborators of who I'm going to talk later about. So uh, let me start with a motivating example. I want to talk about the arithmetic function R of n, which counts the number of ways of writing n as sums of two squares and consider its correlations. So I'm going to consider R of n multiplied with R of n plus four, and I'm going to sum up those quantities up to x minus two, but with some weight, which may you know, be, be confusing at the beginning, I'll put weight one for n even and weight one half for n odd. The function r of n is almost multiplicative in the sense that r of n over four is multiplicative given by the character modulo four, as you see in this equation. Um, it is also unbounded. So correlations of these functions cannot be dealt with the theory of correlations of arithmetic functions which are bounded or have values plus minus one or things like that. The first step in trying to understand this correlation is to rewrite this equation in terms of more variables and eventually reduce it to something that has to do with automorphic forms. So since n is sum of two squares and n plus four is sum of two squares, we write n as t squared plus s squared. We write n plus four as r squared plus u squared. And now we introduce four new variables, a, b, c, d, where a is r plus s over two, b is t plus u over two, c is t minus u over two, and d is r minus s over two. Then the condition that four, which is n plus four minus n, is the difference of sums of two squares can be rewritten with the new variables as the standard determinant condition a d minus b c is equal to one. Okay, here now some parity considerations. If we have that r and s have the same parity and t and u have the same parity, then all the numbers a, b, c, d are going to be integers. On the other hand, if I give you integers a, b, c, and d, you could recover r, u, s, and t by solving the linear system that I wrote before, and here is the solution. Okay. If n is even, one can easily check that r, s, t, and u have the same parity. If n is odd, then r and u will not have the same parity, and s and t will not have the same parity. So either R and S has the same parity or R and T has the same parity. And that will cut down our counting by a factor of one half. This is why for N odd, we introduced the weight one half in the previous slide. It doesn't matter whether you have followed all those parity considerations or not. The upshot is that now we have four new variables, which will be integers for us, A, B, C, and D. They will satisfy the determinant condition for a two by two matrix, A D minus B C is equal to one. And then by just substituting what is A, B, C and D in terms of R, S, T and U, we say that this is N plus two, which will be less than or equal to X because I was saying N is less than X minus two. So we have now rewritten our counting in more variables. So we're looking at integer solutions of the determinant equation where the sum of the squares is less than or equal to x. Now, that will push us very quickly to this uh, realm of automorphic forms. So this is a very quick introduction to what happens in the hyperbolic upper half plane. We have complex numbers with positive imaginary part, and we act on the um, uh, hyperbolic upper half space by linear fractional transformations of the form AZ plus B over CZ plus D, which we set into correspondence with two by two matrices A, B, C, D with determinant one. So the group really that we are going to be interested here is SL2R and in particular discrete subgroups there where A, B, C, and D are integers. This is the group that we call SL2Z. Of similar importance 
in the whole arithmetic of automorphic forms elliptic curves, we have Hecke congruent subgroups where we put the extra condition that um, n is dividing c if the level is n. The more general subgroups that one can consider, and some of the theorems that I'm going to state are going to be stated in the more general framework. Those are subgroups which are co-finite or co-compact. This means that the quotient of the upper half plane by this group gamma is going to have finite hyperbolic area or be a compact space. We will also consider particular examples of co-compact subgroups coming out of quaternion algebras. Okay, so what's now the geometry in the upper half space? We have something called the hyperbolic metric where we have dx squared plus dy squared over y squared. This means that if I give you a curve, x of t plus i of y of t in the upper half plane, then you could use this formula here to calculate its length. And geodesics in the upper half plane will be curves that locally minimize the distance between two points. It is a well-known result from hyperbolic geometry, which you could find in, let's say, Vanet's books on automorphic forms and in many other places, that the geodesics in the upper half plane are rays perpendicular to the real axis emanating from the real axis, like the red line that you see here, or semicircles centered on uh, the real axis. Okay. Uh, now we come to the further reduction of the initial problem to something that has to do with using hyperbolic distance. There is a fundamental point pair invariant in the upper half plane that tells us so how to measure the distance between z and w. So we take the absolute value of z minus w square and we divide with four times the imaginary part of z and the imaginary part of w. And then the cos, hyperbolic cosine of the distance between z and w is 2u of z comma w plus one. Moreover, we can evaluate what happens between the point i in the upper half plane and its orbit where we act on i by a linear fractional transformation a, b, c, d. The calculation gives you exactly the expression sum of squares a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared minus two divided by four. And here is now what we are really asked to do in the correlation problem that I introduce as motivation. We want to count the matrices in SL to Z, so that for U gamma I plus I plus two is less than or equal to X. And this is the quantity that I call NXII. <clears throat> there is a more general problem where we consider W to be the center. We consider another point Z and its orbit gamma Z. And we want to count the matrices in SL to Z so that for U gamma Z comma W plus two is less than or equal to X. This is what we call the hyperbolic point problem. So here is a picture of lattice points. So we start with the point I, the points that we get on uh, the same height are in fact acting on it by translations, one n zero one, n an integer, and then points lower correspond to acting uh, first with some other matrix in a cell to Z and then using horizontal translations. Those points seem to accumulate towards the real axis in our Euclidean eye, but actually in the hyperbolic sense, they all go further and further away. In fact, here is a picture of hyperbolic circle. I couldn't plot the whole of it because it was getting a little bit too big. So what we have is that we have center of the hyperbolic center, the point I and radius R. The hyperbolic center of the circle is lower than the Euclidean center of the circle, but circles remain circles. Another way of thinking of the counting problem is that we draw the same hyperbolic circle. And here in the tessellation of the upper half plane by uh, the standard fundamental domains of SL to Z, we can count basically how many fundamental domains uh, go inside this hyperbolic circle. 
This counting is difficult. Many of you may have seen the Gauss circle problem where we look at standard lattice points in Z2 and how far they go from the origin inside the circle of radius R. This Gauss circle problem and at least Gauss's initial approach was based on the fact that the circumference or the length of the circle is 2 pi r, which is essentially sort of like the square root of the area of the disk contained in it. Unfortunately, this is no longer true in hyperbolic space, and this makes counting difficult. So in particular, we know that the area of a hyperbolic ball centered at i with radius r is 4 sin r over 2 square, and the length of the corresponding circle is 2 pi sin r, and they both grow at the order e to the r. Okay. Now we go a little bit to the history. The first person to deal with this problem is Del Sartre in 1942. I want to pay particular attention to the work of Heinz Huber, who was in Basel. Um, he uh, wrote a series of seminal papers in 59, 60, and 61, and we're going to come back to his work later on. So here is how the theorem looks like. The counting that we want, basically we make W the center and we look at the orbit of gamma uh, gamma z up to some distance relating to x has a main term and an error term. I need to tell you what those are and I need to explain to you what we know about them. So the main term is a finite sum, which is good, and it contains uh, expressions of the form x to the sj. sj will be what we call spectral parameters. I'll tell you what they are. And we multiply in front with uj of z, uj of w conjugate. uj of z is what we call a mass form. There are some extra gamma factors which you could safely ignore, some root of pi you could safely ignore. And the sum is a finite sum over what we call the small eigenvalues of the Laplace operator. So what is happening here is that we have the hyperbolic Laplace operator and we consider the eigenvalue equation on Laplacian uj plus sj1 minus sj uj is equal to zero. And in the main term, we take into account only those parameters sj that are between one half and one. There is always a main term because sj is equal to zero, to one, well, s0 is equal to one always occurs. And that gives us what we would call the main part of the main term. And the other terms corresponding to what we call small eigenvalues may or may not exist depending on the group and depending on whether we have proved the Selber eigenvalue conjecture. So this is how the main term looks like. It involves values of mass forms with eigenvalues uh, less than a quarter or eigenvalue parameters between one half and one. Now, this isn't a theorem until I tell you something about the error term. Otherwise, this does not make sense. So estimates for the error term look like big O x to the power a for some appropriate exponent a. Here is what we know about this exponent a. In 1975, uh, Sam Patterson uh, proved that we can take the exponent a to be three quarters. The exponent two thirds, which is better, uh, is known through a series of work of Selberg in 72, Anton God in 83, and Peter Günther in 1980. Unfortunately, Selberg never published his work on that. However, handwritten notes of his with the exponent two third are available in the website of the Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, the exponent two third has never been improved since basically 72. Okay, so what is the conjecture about the error term? We believe that the error term grows at most like x to the half plus epsilon. And what I want to discuss now is evidence for that. The first evidence that I know is an old theorem of Phillips and Rudnick from 1994 that tells you that we can at least know that through a sequence of x's, we are at least as big as x to the half. And in fact, this is what we call omega results, and they prove big omega of x to the half log log x to the exponent one quarter minus delta. 
The next result that I want to discuss is a result of Tsamithro from 1996 in his thesis. He proved what we call mean square results for the error term. So we square the error term and we integrate in a range of x's from x to 2x and we divide by x in front. And the result is consistent with the conjecture we believe because if the error term grows like x to the half, then the square grows like x to the first power and we get some extra log square of x afterwards and nothing worse than that. So this is the result of Tsamiso that uh, has motivated some of my work in subsequent problems. You may ask also whether we have numerical evidence for the conjecture. This goes back to uh, the work, the first numerical investigation I know of, but not for SL2Z, is due to uh, Phillips and Rudnick. And for SL2Z, here is some of the results that some of my master's students got in the past. We vary the x up to 10 to the 8. We do the exact counting NIIX. And as you see, uh, it's about, the last number here is about 6 times 10 to the 8, which is correct. The 6 is exactly uh, 2 pi over the volume of SL2Z, which is the correct constant predicted by the theorem. The error term is listed here. As you see, the error term is growing. And we also have in the third column what I would call the relative error term or normalized error term where we divide the error term by x to the half. And as you see, the numbers we get in the third column are rather small. Let's now go to graph those things. So you could graph this normalized error term again up to 10 to the 8. And if you pay some attention at the numbers that we see here and here, this is five and five. So although on the x-axis we go up to 10 to the eight, on the y-axis we are between plus minus eight, really. So it seems, based at least on the numerical investigation, that the conjecture is true. However, we are far away from proving it. I also do not believe that those numerical investigations can provide anything deeper in terms of proving theorems about these kind of things. Okay. Now I want to move to other counting problems in the hyperbolic space, reminding uh, people that know about automorphic forms that SL2R has three distinct types of subgroups. So up to conjugation, we are interested into three types of subgroups elliptic subgroups, which look like cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta, essentially SO2. Hyperbolic subgroups, which have two real eigenvalues with product one, so they can be conjugated to look like M0, 0, M inverse, and parabolic subgroups that shift to the right or to the left by the real number X. Now, we will start with some discrete subgroup of SL to R, you could think of SL to Z, and we can intersect this subgroup with some of those groups on the left and some on the right and form double cosets. Because H1 and H2 can be either elliptic, hyperbolic, or parabolic, that leaves us with nine cases. Okay? And the case that we have described so far is the case where we take H1 and H2 to be elliptic subgroups, which essentially intersect with gamma would be a small finite group, the stabilizer of points. Okay, let's discuss now uh, the um, uh, situation about what we call the elliptic hyperbolic problem. This was discussed by Huber. So Huber introduced it in 59 and also wrote his last paper in 98 about the same problem. So the problem is about a point in the upper half plane Z and its orbit, let's say the point gamma Z or the various points gamma Z. We also put the hyperbolic subgroup in such a way that the corresponding closed geodesic on the Riemann surface H mod gamma lies on the imaginary axis and is represented by this dark segment that you see here, which I call L. So this segment goes, let's say, from the point i to m square i. Okay. Then we want to count the distance, measure the distance from gamma z to this imaginary axis, and uh, 
it's a very easy way, an easy calculation in hyperbolic geometry that the cosine of the distance from Z to L is one over the standard cosine of this angle theta here. Um, there is some change of variables to make the theorems look the same as in the previous case. So we are counting the elements in this coset so that the distance from gamma z to L is less than or equal to T. And then what Huber studied and Anton God improved in 1983 is the following result here. The counting has a main term C times X some subsidiary main terms here, again corresponding to small eigenvalues, mass forms, and some error term, which we call now EXZH. Huber, for the error term, he didn't get the best result. What we know through Anton Good's work is X to the two thirds. Um, Anton Good's work is basically a complicated monograph, which I have here, uh, local analysis of the Selberg trace formula. Uh, which is very difficult to read uh, because out of those nine cases that I was mentioning before, he discusses all of them at the same time uh, with a unified approach without introducing any special functions and with complicated notation that makes the statements and the results difficult to read. So what you do in those cases is that essentially you sit down and try to redo any of those problems with your own means and understand with your own techniques and prove new theorems with your own techniques. Because frankly, um, it's a very difficult book to read. Okay. So what is the conjecture in the elliptic hyperbolic case? We make the same conjecture that the error term should grow as big O of X to the half plus epsilon. And in 2016, with Hadzakos, we proved the mean square result consistent with a conjecture similar to the result of Chamiso. The error term in mean square grows like big O of x to the first power log square x. And in 2019, um, he also proved a big omega result. And in fact, a lot of big omega results that are complicated, and I will just leave them as big omega of x to the half. The next problem that I want to discuss is what we call the hyperbolic hyperbolic counting problem. In this case, I've plotted here the Riemann surface that is the quotient H mod gamma. And in this case, we have two hyperbolic subgroups giving us two closed geodesics on the quotient, which are represented here by those green things. Okay. This problem has been studied by Anton God but also people in dynamical systems, in particular Parkonen and Polin, people in automorphic forms, Kimball, Martin, McGee, and Wambach. There is also an unpublished letter of Suzuki and work of me and my students, Lekas and Vosku. Okay, for the simplified situation, we are allowed to take the two geodesics to be the same, but let's look first of all, how, what we're going to measure geometrically in this case. So what we are going to do is that we are going to draw geodesic segments that start on the one of the green geodesics and go towards the other geodesic, uh, also to meet it perpendicularly. So this is the first geodesic segment here. But the geodesic segment could wrap around quite a lot on the Riemann surface, like this one here, that goes around the hole as well. So those geodesic segments are going to have lengths. Those lengths will form a discrete set increasing to infinity, and we want to count the length of those segments. That's the geometric problem. Okay, let's move now to the situation in the upper half plane where we might visualize things easier. I'm assuming here now that the two geodesics are the same. I represented uh, both of them here on the imaginary axis from I to M square I. And I look at various images of the imaginary axis under linear fractional transformations. Those are the semicircles that you see. And the dark part of the semicircles is the image of the geodesic segment here corresponding to the closed geodesic on the quotient. And here is the uh, geodesic segments of which we are counting the length. They are represented by these green arcs here, meeting perpendicularly the, uh, 
whoops, the um, semicircles and the imaginary axis. So here's what we know about the situation. We can uh, see how the group element gamma gets involved into this, or more precisely, how the matrix entries A, B, C, D are helping us count the lengths of those hyperbolic segments. This is achieved by an elementary lemma that if you look on the imaginary axis I, Y, 2, and you look at the image of the imaginary axis under gamma, the smallest length, which is essentially uh, what uh, the fundamental point pair invariant does, is going to be twice the absolute value of A, D plus B, C, if the product of the entries is positive and zero otherwise. And here is the theorem, which I attribute to Anton God in 83, but with a new proof by me and Lekas in 2023. We want to count the number of elements in the double coset so that AD plus BC is less than or equal to X. And we have asymptotics for that. There is a main term, subsidiary main terms having to do with small eigenvalues and an error term. What do we know about those things? The constant in front of the main term is twice the length square divided by pi times the volume. In the subsidiary main terms, we don't see the values any longer. We see the integral of the uj over this geodesic segment square. And for the error term, uh, the result is still of the form x to the two thirds. The conjecture is x to the half plus epsilon. And we have a mean square result, which we proved in 2024, that is consistent with the conjecture. Uh, there is also a theorem, a big omega result of those school, that it is big O of x to the half as expected. So all of those theorems so far go in analogy. Let's now move to an arithmetic application of this result. We consider a particular quaternion algebra and it's embedding into SL2R, and I'm not going to write it down for you right now. Uh, and we consider a particular hyperbolic matrix M0, 0, M inverse, where M is the square of a fundamental unit in Q adjoining root 2. And then we look at how this matrix acts on the imaginary axis, and it produces a geodesic segment L, so it is the imaginary axis divided by the group generated by H. We also fix some prime P congruent to 5 modulo 8, and some issues with quaternion algebras, orders which are not necessarily maximal, etc., that I don't want to go into. But here is the new arithmetic function that plays a role in this counting problem. We want to count ideals in z square root of 2 that have norm equal to k. And then a theorem uh, that goes back to Hedgehal in 78 gives us correlations of this arithmetic function. So uh, the number of ideals of norm k multiplied with the number of ideals of norm pk plus 1 summed up to capital X plus what happens if you have number of ideals here of norm pk minus 1 has asymptotics. And those are the asymptotics that we have. Uh, there is a subsidiary main term and a big O of x to the two thirds. This result was first proved by Hedgehal for p is equal to 5 and generalized last year by my student Vosku. Actually, Hedgehal proved a slightly more precise result for p is equal to 5. He didn't have the sum of the two summons, so he had them separately. And so the natural question is, can we separate those two summons and get half in the main term? The answer is yes. If we notice that actually there are some hidden parameters in this problem, and all those uh, issues that I'm trying to explain are easier to explain in graphs rather than writing down formulas, which eventually one has to do. So again, in the picture, we have the imaginary axis and the geodesic represented by this segment from i to m square i, and we look at its image. Its image will fall either to the left or to the right. So that distinguishes already two cases. But also, the way we are traversing the image plays a role. So if we look, for instance, on the right here, 
for the element gamma three, gamma three of zero is here to the right of gamma three of infinity. So that moves in this direction while gamma four of zero is here and gamma four of infinity is here and you're moving to the right direction. So that gives you an extra parameter, another plus or minus. So what happens and was in fact understood by God is that the four subcases in the hyperbolic hyperbolic case and one aims to separate them. This is done in a theorem that uh, was understood in some Condrandu papers of Hedgehal in 78 with no details of proofs, also in Anton God's book, which is unreadable. And then my student in 2023 has written down a complete proof that we believe is understandable. So each of the four cases uh, gets its fair share of asymptotics, one quarter of what I was describing in the previous slides. As a result, we could also separate in the arithmetic counting the two summands as we expect. So what goes into this separating the four cases? So here I have the same picture, but I've also plotted a ray emanating from zero, which is not a geodesic because it is not vertical. It goes through an angle theta with the imaginary axis. The image of this ray is not going to be a geodesic either, but we notice that in the case of gamma three, where you are moving from right towards left, the image of this ray is in fact included inside, while in the case of gamma four, when you move from gamma four zero to gamma four infinity to the right, we've got that the image of this ray is outside. And playing with this inside, outside and left and right, and using some sort of perturbation or let's say differentiation in the theta parameter, we can in fact separate the four cases and get the full version and understanding of Anton Good's theorem from 83. Okay, let me now move to equidistribution. In the classical hyperbolic uh, point problem, we've got the center Z and the orbit gamma W and uh, the point is at a certain distance from Z, so it puts it on some hyperbolic circle that I have plotted here. To specify the exact location of the point gamma W, we need also to specify an angle, which we get as the angle between the vertical line and the tangent at the point Z of the uh, hyperbolic uh, radius. These angles are well known to be equidistributed. It's an old theorem of Selberg, Anton God, and Nichols. If you want more precise result on equidistribution, for instance, at which rate can we control the discrepancy in the equidistribution? This is a result of uh, my collaborator, Morten Rizer, and his student, Truelsen. Let's now see what happens in the elliptic hyperbolic case. In this case, we have the orbit of the point Z. So let's say gamma Z is here. And then we observe the geodesic segment that starts at that point and goes towards the imaginary axis and meets the imaginary axis at the point P of gamma. Uh, you could ask what happens with the points P of gamma. We have to reduce them by the hyperbolic element to be inside this segment from i to m square i. And one expects that they also become equidistributed. This follows from the work of Good, but also from all the work of Herman. If you want more precise results, this can be done. This is work in progress of my student. That means discrepancy with error there and applying the errors to right inequality as in all previous cases. In the case of hyperbolic hyperbolic, then this is what the image looks like. We've got the imaginary axis and the semicircle, and we are looking at the geodesic segment in green from this point to this point. The points P of gamma are in this segment. The point Q of gamma is on this ray. You could move it back and get another point. And in this case, we also have joint equidistribution. That means we count 
all double cosets so that the distance between L and gamma L is less than or equal to R. Uh, and that goes in the denominator. In the numerator, we put all those elements such that P of gamma and Q of gamma belong to the, uh, let's say, the interval 1M square uh, to the square. In fact, the correct way to do it is to use a logarithmic measure, and then in the end, we can prove this equidistribution result. For error terms and discrepancy, this is work in progress of uh, my student. Okay, now I want to go a little bit more quickly about other cases that I have not discussed that have occupied the research community in, let's say, analytic number theory and automorphic forms for a while. The parabolic elliptic case, so you have a parabolic subgroup on the one side and an elliptic case on the other. For the elliptic subgroup, we can start, for instance, with a negative discriminant and consider corresponding Hegner points in the upper half plane. For instance, you could take the point I. Then the image of I under SL to Z is going to be a complex number, which will have a real part rational mu over m and an imaginary part i over m. And the interesting thing is that if you follow all the identifications, mu is not random. Mu is going to satisfy a congruence condition mu square congruent to minus one modulo m. It's a result of Rizer and Rudnick from 2009 that the real parts, those rational numbers mu over m equidistribute modulo one. Of course, it also follows from the work of good, but never expressed this way. It's a much harder result and perhaps a lot more interesting to look at what uh, Duke, Friedlander and Ivanietz proved in 1995. They consider not just for the point I, but also for other irreducible quadratic polynomials X squared plus D, the functions mu over P where now you consider the equation mu square congruent to D modulo P only over the primes. And the result is that actually those uh, fractions also equidistribute modulo one. This is a much harder theorem. Moving to the parabolic hyperbolic case, in this case, you divide on the left by parabolic subgroup and on the right by hyperbolic subgroup. And all the thing that changes versus the previous uh, situation is that now the discriminant becomes positive. And now we are interested in solving the congruence equation, mu square congruent to D modulo M, but for positive D. An old result of Hooley says that the fractions mu over M equidistribute modulo one. And Arpad Toth in his thesis in 2000 prove that if we restrict only to prime numbers p, they also get equidistributed. More recently, in 2023, Jens Markloff and Welsh computed the per correlation of those fractions mu over m. And I'm not going to go into that. Okay. Here is some other recent work that is rather exciting. In 1999, Erdos and Hall refined um, a lot the orig original result of Gauss about counting points in the circle. Actually, the result of Gauss can be uh, slightly refined to count points inside sectors. But Erdos and Hall prove that we have equidistribution on most circles representing sums of squares on the circle themselves. So here for a particular circle, we have all the solutions to the equation x squared plus y squared is equal to the given integer. And for most circles, we are going to get equidistribution. It's natural to ask whether a similar result holds in the hyperbolic plane. In 2021, Hedzakos, Kuhlberg, Lester, and Wigman proved that this is true for most hyperbolic circles and for the group SL to Z. Slightly later, Cherubini and Fazari generalized that by looking at uh, some other situations that deal with uh, other Hegner points rather than just the point I. What is interesting to notice is that when we started with the original problem, we were dealing with R of n, R of n plus four. 
So we're really considering two distinct circles, one with a radius square root of n and another one with radius square root of n plus four. And essentially the considerations we had mean that we're looking at integers that like that lie on uh, integer points that lie on those two circles. So what I have plotted here is a bunch of circles in pairs, according to color, that go along uh, odd numbers that we consider here. So the radius square should be four apart. So we have one and root five, root three and root seven, uh, root five and root nine, which is three. Now, as you see in this picture, uh, in one case, the circle seems to be sort of darker or somehow confused in color. This is because in the outer uh, of the annuli that we have in black, we also have the inner circle for the annuli that appears in red. So what happens is that the equidistribution of angles or equidistribution of points now can be understood through some clever arguments by moving back to the Euclidean case, studying Gaussian integers. Okay. There's another interesting theorem of Friedlander and Ivanets in 2009, which they call the hyperbolic prime number theorem. So again, we consider matrices A, B, C, D. Again, we measure how far we go by the sum of squares, a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared. But now we demand that the result is a prime number. And you could ask, how many matrices do we have like that up to sum of the four squares less than or equal to x? It is not an unconditional theorem that we have. Uh, Fried, Lanner, and Ivanitz need fairly strong conjectures. The simplest one or more well-known one would be the elliott halberstam conjecture or some result which may be slightly weaker, like level of distribution, somehow close to one. And the result is that we know that this counting grows like x over log x, upper and lower bound. We don't have proven asymptotics in this case. This problem is supposed to be almost equally hard as the twin prime conjecture. Okay, so let's go back to our SL2R. Uh, in SL2R, we have the Cartan decomposition, which is the KAK, K is SO2. And that provides us for every matrix in SL2R with two angles for each one of the SO2s. Two thetas, theta one and theta two, which we consider to belong to zero pi square. And the result from 2024 with uh, Morten Rizer is that we have equidistribution of the pairs of angles if we vary over primes P, which are written as sums of four squares, subject, of course, to the determinant condition AD minus BC is equal to one. We could even do something similar for the hyperbolic hyperbolic case. The decomposition here is probably not as well known as the Cartan decomposition, but here it is. We could write a matrix in SL2R as a matrix cos V sin V sin V cos V, and on the left, a, a hyperbolic matrix, and on the right, another hyperbolic matrix with parameters Y1 and Y2. And in this case, we consider a particular quaternion algebra embedded into SL2R relating to Q root two. So this is what uh, matrices we include, X zero plus X one root two, root five X two plus X three root two, and similar things on the second row. It is the same thing that we're considering in the earlier arithmetic application. M is going to be one plus root two square. And the way to count in this case is BC divided by five. This is the product of those entries divided by five, which is X two square minus two X three square. And here is the result from 2024. If we look at log Y one and log Y two, and we normalize with this quantity here, which is fixed beforehand, those numbers are distributed in zero one square or modulo one square. And this is true if we restrict that the counting works over the prime numbers. Okay, I think that uh, my time will be finishing soon. So let me just say some quick things about what goes into the proof. We need to consider periods of mass forms of weight zero and of weight two. 
So a period is basically integrating a mass form of weight zero, that's what zero symbolizes here, over the geodesic segment I m square I. We act on the mass form of weight zero by a raising operator, and then we consider its period as well. Huber proved a mean square estimate for the periods of weight zero, and my student was could generalize that for weight one and higher weights. The next ingredient that we need is a relative trace formula that looks like a daunting slide. So I don't want you to try to memorize it at all. I just want to tell you a little bit what relative trace formula look when you work with hyperbolic subgroups rather than parabolics, which is more well known. So in those relative trace formula, there is a geometric side on the left and there is a spectral side on the right. Let's start with the geometric side. There is a quantity relating to the problem. We've seen this quantity before, AD plus BC. There is a test function F and some simple transform of it, G0 and G1. And we evaluate F, G0 and G1 over the various double cosets that we are involved. And on the right hand side, there are the periods square of the mass forms of weight zero or of weight two. And in front of them, we've got some other transform of the function f of the test function. Those transforms are complicated. The first one we call the Huber transform, and they're given by specific integrals versus hypergeometric functions. And this is a process uh, similar to the selbeck heilschander transform that one normally meets in the analytic theory of automorphic forms. In fact, it's a process that can be deduced from the selbeck heilschander transform as well. And the last ingredient that one needs is large sieve inequalities. I will state them here for the case that we have essentially co-compact subgroup and the eigenvalues are discrete parameterized by Tj. So we have some finite sequence uh, Aj and the L norm, L2 norm square will be the summation of the mod Aj square where we extend up to the height in the spectrum T. Moreover, we fix some point in the upper half plane or in the modular surface and finite number of points x1, x2 up to xr in a big interval x to 2r. Those points need to be well spaced by at least the distance delta. And then the theorem, which I list here, the large sieve inequalities that have appeared before or used before is by Chamiso, Lekas and Vosku. So they always look the same we try to exploit the oscillation of x to the itj using weights, either the values of the mass form or the periods of it, or the periods of the mass form of weight two. In the right-hand side, we see the L2 norm of A in all cases, and something that has to do with the average growth of those quantities here. In the case of values, the local value law gives you t square. In the case of periods, we just get t. Okay, I think my time is running out very soon. So let me now go to the open questions. Um, there are obviously a huge number of problems and results that I did not mention. Um, let me say that my number one interest would be to improve the error term from big O to X to the two thirds to anything really better than X to the two thirds. It's a problem that has been left open for 50 years. We don't know any improvement for any group arithmetic or not, and for any points uh, Z and W, and certainly not for any interesting points like Kegra points. The second problem is refined statistics for the various lattice counting problems. For instance, per correlation in all the cases. The per correlation has been computed in a bunch of cases, but not in all of them. Then there is the question of arithmetic applications. Uh, there've been some other applications that I haven't described in H3, but we need to write down more because they can be actually fairly concrete. Then there is the issue of higher dimensional hyperbolic spaces and equidistribution there. We have results in higher dimensions already in Fricker's thesis, in Basel, um, but um, somehow the large sieve inequalities that we have in three dimensions seem to be worse and they do not produce the expected mean square results. 
So we have even less evidence of what is happening concerning our conjectures in higher dimensional hyperbolic space. The next item is higher rank and other situations. It goes without saying that uh, the problems that I described are only in a particular flavor applying to hyperbolic space. Uh, a much bigger project has been uh, originated in the work of Duke, Rudnick, and Sarnak in 93, and the paper was called Density of Integer Points on Affine Homogeneous Varieties. And in that paper, they introduced some of the problems also that I have discussed, but various other problems in higher rank that seem to be a lot harder. In particular, the case of SLNZ seems to be the hardest, well, one of the most interesting and hard ones. In 2023, Blomer and Lutzko provided a first, I would say, good error term for the counting problem for SLNZ. So the main term grows like x to the power n n minus one, and they can save something from the main term in the error term. And what they save behaves better and better as the dimension uh, of S L N Z increases. So this constant delta n behaves like one plus one over root two plus big O of one over n. It is highly desirable that other cases of affine homogeneous varieties are studied. Thank you very much for your attention.